Hello Steelers and welcome to this preview, review, first look I guess at Nevermind the Bill Hooks, the deluxe version. Uh, this was sent through to me by Dan over at War Games Illustrated, so thank you very much Dan for sending this through. Uh, I did actually get a little later than I <laughs> anticipated because I missed his email by a couple of days, so I do apologise for that Dan. Uh, this is set to be released on the 21st, which uh, I believe is Monday. I'm not sure when I'll get this video out either. Uh, hoping on Saturday, maybe Sunday, but uh, so I'm going to get it out be hopefully before the release date. But I know a lot of people who had it on pre-order and are waiting for it and can get it through quite a few different places. We'll talk about that in a second. Now you're wondering, probably wondering why I'm doing a review of uh, this, never mind the Bill Hooks, having never shown any interest whatsoever in the period that it plays, which is really from Wars of the Roses onwards, medieval warfare. Well, I just thought I'd do a, a look at it as somebody basically who has never uh, never really uh, played this period before or looked at it. So, you know, this is a, I think, overall this is quite a good introduction to the period. I'm sure there's probably, uh, you know, historians will probably pull their hair out at some of the things in there, but as it says in the introduction itself, the, the period that he, that he touches on, a lot of it obviously is, uh, you know, it's difficult to get actual fixed uh, sources on some of the the uh, periods that are being played, and you know, there's there's always uh, a lot of arguments uh, historically and also archaeologically as well about some of uh, these periods that are covered by this book. So I thought it'd be an interesting thing to look at it from my point of view. I've read through uh, the rules basically. I've got a reasonable idea of how the rules work uh, in my head, and they look pretty good actually. I'm I'm quite impressed with them. Uh, there's a few things I would change as always, uh, but that's just me. Uh, but we'll talk about those as we go through them and as I talk a bit more about it. And I wanted to show you really as well what's inside the book, what you get in the book as well, as uh, this is, uh, like I say, an eagerly, I think it's a relatively eagerly anticipated uh, release. Um, as the, the, the original, the, the free version that came out with um, War Games Illustrated is, has proved to be very, very popular uh, in War Gaming circles and I've seen it played quite a lot over the last couple of years at various conventions and shows and things. Uh, Chris Bree over at uh, Winston Ab Reese, I think he calls himself, uh, he, on Twitter at least, it's also his... Um, uh, I think that is also his his, uh, his his YouTube channel. He's covered a lot of the Bill Hooks stuff as well. Uh, I'll put a link to his channel in the description down below uh, so you can go and check that stuff out as well. So he's uh, somebody who probably knows a lot more about this this period and also these rules as well than I would do. But as I say, I, I thought I'd look at it from a, uh, a newcomer's idea. That doesn't mean to say that I'm going to be getting into Wars of the Roses anytime soon, uh, but <laughs> you never know. Um, actually, what I've read in this makes me think, you know, this could be quite a good fun game at some point to, uh, to dip my toes into. Uh, Dan also sent over a letter as well of introduction and also just a little bit more information about this. So I'm, I'm going to, I'll read out some bits and pieces here for you just uh, because it, I think, it, you know, it's worthwhile doing it because this is some of the stuff that they've said, they've asked for. Uh, so yes, basically the, it, it came about really this Redux is because of uh, there was a lot of clamour about just developing the game more and just adding more periods of history to it because it started out I believe as a War of the Roses uh, large skirmish game and they've added quite a lot more into it in this uh, de deluxe version of it. Uh, it covers actually eight conflicts from the 14th century, 100 years wards to the early 16th century Italian wars so there's quite a lot uh, covered even just in the book itself so just as you're coming into it like you said like a, if you were a newcomer like myself there is quite a lot to pick and choose from in there and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that as well as we go on. Uh, it's not a high investment game you can be up and running with a few uh, boxes of uh, plastic Perry miniatures even though there are others available. Uh, it is also based largely on luck uh, strategy and tactics are important, but the D6 dice goddess can tip the balance firmly. And also there is cards as well, there's a card system in it as well, which uh, adds a little bit more to look and friction as well. Uh, as he says here, there are cards and tokens which add a period flavour and also excitement. You can play these as you go along, we'll talk about those as we come to them. And it's also supported by a very friendly and active Facebook group as well, So, you, who, where the author himself, uh, Dan Callan, is also... Uh, a part of so you can you know dip in and ask rules questions and things 
just to give you the actual practical information here, we, uh, it is actually 100 page pages, uh, A4 uh, bound soft back book, you can see here. Uh, it will be selling for uh, £25, that's in the UK, 35 US dollars or 49.95 Australian dollars. The release date, as I said, is Monday, Monday the 21st of November. Whether this video is out before then or after then, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to try to get it out as soon as I can. You will need some extra, extras such as MDF tokens and laminated card decks for the core rules, Albion and also the Europa theatres. Uh, these will be available to purchase separately. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another con uh, expense to consider, but obviously a lot of people like to have the you know official things. However, they're not essential to the game, it does say, and they can be downloaded or copied from the book free of charge, and there is uh, tokens and things which I'll show you in there. In the UK, you can get this from War Games Illustrated, North Star Military Figures uh, and Arcane Scenery, uh, and any other good retail hobby, uh, hobby retailers in the US. Uh, it's Ironheart Artisans are selling this, and in Australia and New Zealand, Khaki and Green Books. So if you're in those areas, you can go directly to those. It doesn't mention anywhere in Europe, I'm assuming you'd probably get it through the UK, through War Games Illustrated. And also there will be a downloadable PDF version of the rules as well, which will be for £20. And again, that's available from the 21st of November. So that's the basic information. That's the introduction to the to uh, why I'm doing this review, and you know, I guess why they've sent it over to me as well. So as I say, what we'll do is I'll jump in a bit closer. We'll have a, look, a close up look at the book itself, and you'll see what you get in here. Uh, and there's quite a lot in here. Actually, I was quite surprised about the amount of information in here that they've packed into 180 pages. So let's do it. So this is a close up here of the cover and it is a really attractive cover. Uh, if nothing else, the uh, production values on this are really high. The only thing I would say is it's not a hardback, but you know, the fact that it's a really lovely uh, looking book, very attractive. This is the kind of thing that you know you would certainly draw your eye if you were wandering around a show and you were looking for a new set of rules. I think this is the kind of thing that pull you in. Also to mention, it does come as well with a uh, quick reference sheet so this one's for Albion, which is, I think it's the War of the Roses version of this, which is the original version. So it just basically gives you the uh, the movement and firing and saves and what have you on there. And then on the back, it's also got the core rules action list as well, the various lists that you can take. So uh, really nice. Uh, it's always good to see these included in rules. Uh, I do like, I do appreciate that kind of thing. Looking on the back, no pictures on the back, unfortunately, but it does give you a breakdown of the games itself, a bit of an introduction and also the uh, conflicts that you can find in the book. Let's just go through them quickly here before, I'm going to show you them in a little bit more detail later on, but let's just, it just gives you an idea of what you get. So you've got Albion Wars of the Roses, I was right, Gallia, the Hundred Years War, Bohemia, the Hussite Wars, Helvetia, the Swiss Burungian Wars, Italia, the Italian Wars, Northumbria, the Scottish Anglo-Scottish Border Reavers, Lusitania, uh, late medieval Portugal, and also Hibernia warfare in Ireland as well. So, uh, you know, if it, as I say, I'm, it's not really a, a period of history that I know much about medieval warfare. But if I was looking to get into it, I probably would pick these rules up. Just to give you some idea of uh, some of the history, if nothing else, you know, a potted history across this uh, vast and confusing uh, period, if nothing else. Right, so let's dive straight in, shall we? And as you said, as I already mentioned it, you know, we it's a very, very lovely looking book. It's the, I like reading rules, and I like reading rules that look nice and, and are attractive and are easy to read. And this certainly is, uh, just for the, you know, it's got... Uh, uh, these kind of the, the 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 fonts they've used, even the the illustrations on the side of things, it's it's period. You know, it it, it gets you already into a mood for reading it. Uh, I'm going to be an introduction here, uh, and then an introduction, a very brief introduction here uh, by Andy Callan, the uh, the the writer on the Wars of Roses, this is the album. And again, you know, I I couldn't say exactly how much of this is, you know. 100% modern academic work but I, I would say that this is a relatively good introduction to it and if you are coming into something you know I, I always think with historical wargaming half of the the joy is doing the research anyway uh, and I think that's something if you, uh, but also if you just wanted to, to set up and play a game then this is I guess this is pretty perfect for you you know if you just want to uh, dip your toe a little bit into the history 
These are the core rules. This starts at page six. We've got good contents page here. They, I have noticed, I don't think there's an index in this, uh, which is always a down vote on my part, uh, but uh, that's uh, that's something uh, something else. Uh, but we do have a contents at least. So, you, And to be fair, the rules themselves, there's not a huge amount of them. Uh, there is literally, I think, 37 pages of uh, core rules. Uh, these are optional rules and summaries from page 30 onwards. Well, actually, page is 37, so there's actually only about 30 pages of core rules itself. Not a huge amount in here, but I've read through these. And again, I'm not going to, I've never played through uh, Nevermind a Bill Hooks, and uh, uh, all, I've, all I've got to go in is, is my reading of it here. And I'll point out some of the things that I like very much about it, uh, the things that did jump out at me. Uh, <clears throat> Brief introduction to organising your uh, your armies. Uh, so they basically go in infantries are either six skirmisher figures uh, based in twos, or, or they can be based individually. Companies are twelve infantry, and then uh, what else do we have here? We also have should have somewhere in here some uh, cavalry, uh, which I think are based in uh, eight men. I think they're for for cavalry. Or is that on the, on the next page? Uh, let me just show you. Uh, squadron nice 2468 yes they are eight men <laughs> should have found that so uh, but it, that gives you an idea of how big your forces are going to be basically and, and also some nice illustrations of some of the figures as well that they obviously use uh, with their companies and also the formations that they will come into a brief description here over of the tokens as well the morale tokens and also disarray and uh, morale uh, and, and damage tokens and things that you will need which are actually included in the rules. You can cut those out or print them or whatever. You can uh, download them. Uh, a brief talk about uh, points values. I'm not a man who is interested in points values uh, per se, but a lot of people like them, you know, and it also you know, can give you at least a balanced army or balanced game if that's what the kind of thing you're wanting. So you can, you know, easily work out a points value for your games if you want to. Over here we have leaders. Uh, this is something that really stood out to me because I like a lot of Too Far Lardy's games and I can see in this game quite a lot of similarities with Sharp Practice, for example, uh, with having uh, leaders uh, that you, you attach to units to get them to do things. And it's similar here. However, in Sharp Practice you have four levels of leader. In this you only have three. So you have heroes, commanders and dolts. And they only have a certain amount of leadership value. Uh, heroes have a three, uh, commanders uh, have class two, and then dolts are class one. And this is how many orders they are able to give out in a turn. So very similar to the leaders in sharp practice, uh, but obviously you're missing out on that level four. I suppose quite easily if you wanted to. You could have more levels to this if that's what you wanted. And these work off cards, which we'll talk about in a second again. So there's quite a lot of similarities with Sharp Practice. It feels a little bit like it's uh, uh, it's been influenced quite a lot by Sharp Practice. But there's a few differences that, uh, that come up, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. And that, the main difference, is the three different card decks that you get. So you have the play deck which basically you you pull a card out and then that acts whatever happen uh, you know whichever card you pull out that leader or those units will activate uh, and then you also have a bonus deck and you also have a special events deck which are drawn from when you draw out their cards from the play deck as well which is quite nice i uh, this this bit left me a little cold i just thought there's probably maybe too many decks here uh three decks is quite a lot uh it's a it's quite a bit of clutter on the tabletop but again you know who am i to say this is how you know plenty of people like this game so it must it must work some way and i'm and as i say i've not played it so i don't know how it plays on the tabletop but i just thought maybe you know one too many decks uh, some of these things could quite easily be put into the main deck itself or mixed in you know uh, as a role somewhere else but it, it's it's just different ways of doing different things uh, so for example i mean like the special events is to talk about sharp practice specifically it's, you know it's a, that is a a table that you have to consult in the rules which you know you could argue takes you out of the game at least this you're just pulling a card out and reading it similar kind of thing uh, but I, I do like card games. I like card activated games because it gives you a lot of friction. 
The only thing with this one, again, is I, will, I keep taking it back to sharp practice, but that's because I do like that game. And the thing with sharp practice is you've got that tiffing card in that stops the turn. In this one, you just ignore the last card in the play deck. Uh, so you will always play through all the cards until the very last one, which means you may get stuck with one card not not coming up, you know, the card that you're, you're after. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, I think with the Tiffin card, it's adding a bit more friction because, you know, not everything is going to, to activate. And uh, it's similar in this, but you've still got quite a lot of chance of something, everything doing something, which is, you know, each to their own, but I, I'm 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 particularly interested in in command and control, and I think the the fewer things that are allowed, the more things that are allowed not to do something, the better. But you know, it, it's a game at the end of the day, and different people approach these differently. What I very much like in this is, as the game starts, you have a manoeuvre phase. So you set up basically, you know, on opposite sides of the table or wherever the scenario says, generally on opposite sides of the table. But then you actually start moving uh, your units one at a time. And you can do this as much as you want, as often as you want with each of the units, obviously, you know, alternating until somebody interrupts it, either with an attacking or a shooting. And that's when the actual main battle starts. And I really like this. Again, to go back to Lardius, this reminds me, uh, in a roundabout way, of the patrol phase in um, Chain of Command, where you both, you know, you're trying to get into a position where your forces are going to be able to either overwhelm or be, just be in a, a more advantageous position. And this is what you're using this for, so I quite like that. I think that's a really good way of speeding up that, that early part of the game rather than just having people marching across the table. You know, you, you do this quickly and then it gets to a point where the actual fighting starts and that's when you start drawing the cards. And I really, really like that. I thought that, that stood out to me very much. As I say, I... Uh, I'm happy with, with relatively simplified games, and this is quite simplified in its combat, but it's that you know it's that manoeuvre at the start that's going to get you into that position that is going to give you that advantage, and, I, and I, uh, that really stood out to me. That, and also, like I say, pulling the, uh, the cards as well, both of those aspects, I think, are, are pretty good, really. Uh, so... To, 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 to mention it again, uh, sharp practice is basically you, you uh, your leaders will activate units, and when those units activate, they have two actions, very similar to sharp practice. Uh, so if you know that game, you'll know this pretty well. And again, that's quite a nice way of doing things. That you know, it's the leaders that are the ones that are, that are causing the the armies to attack and the, getting them in into the battle. And I really like that. Uh, and it just you just basically put down an order to show who's done something again nicely illustrated here uh, with various things and it just it works really well I, I, well I can see it working really well because I know it from other games and it that's the kind of thing that does work well so I think that will be an interesting aspect and it's something that I probably I, I can't really think I've seen so much in medieval games this feels a little bit more dynamic than a lot of other medieval style games of this size. I could be wrong because I don't. It's not really a period of wargaming that I know much about, but it just feels like there's just a, a little touch extra in this than there is in. It feels like in others. Uh, so we've already mentioned it anyway on the quick reference sheet, but there are your core action lists. Uh, so you can do two of these. Each unit can do two of these in a turn. They do various things, you know, turning a brown face, moving, uh, turning in uh, in a, uh, a, a what's, what's it called? A wheel, uh, shooting, rallying. Uh, pack up their uh, artillery and any other special things that they can do as well. Then we go on to movement. Uh, very basic, to be fair, fairly honest. Uh, but the, the movement isn't uh, doesn't really stand out to me. It's it's fixed movement, which if you've watched this uh, channel enough, and I'm sure some of you have. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really keen on fixed movements anymore these days. I'd really find it uh, quite staid and pedestrian, but lots of rules still use it, and lots of people still like it. And if that's what you like, that's what you like. Personally, I don't. But as I say, to me, this is just this is just relatively s similar to any other uh, any other set of rules really that uses fixed movement. There's nothing that stands out with that. Uh, but that's just the way it is. Uh, shooting. 
we'll come back to that because I'm going to talk a little bit more about combat and things. Uh, relatively simple. It's all done on d6s, as with the other, uh, the other, the, uh, the, the the other firing. Uh, sorry, the other fighting as well. It's all done on d6s, and basically you just need to roll uh, a hit. So skirmishers are hitting on five ups. Kern are hitting on fives up. You know, so it's uh, archers. Under nine inches are hitting on five up, long range, nine to 15 is uh, six up, basically a six to hit. So, uh, you know, pretty simple stuff. And then you save, you do a save roll. And these, I think after a first couple of turns, even within a game, the save rolls will, will stick to you. These, they change. So let's just go through them because it's similar in the combat, uh, close combat. So heavy men at arms will save on a three up, mediums. Uh, so that's billmen, pikemen, and knights. Uh, on vulnerable horses, though, they save on a four up. Uh, light archers, skirmishers, and light horse they save on a five up. And then naked, that's kern and levy infantry, they save on a six. You, I think that I, you know I could probably remember that in my first game quite easily. It's it's pretty simple, it's pretty obvious, uh, and it's a quick way of doing it. You just roll, you roll to see how many hit. And then you roll to see how many you save. Nice. Everybody gets a go. And that is how melee works. Uh, you basically add up the number of people in the melee. And you roll that number of dice. And then that number of dice uh, on fours up are hits. Uh, I like this kind of this kind of uh, game in this. Again, uh, it's two fat lardies style uh, with lots of dice in your hand. You know, if you've got a big fight going on and you're just looking for those fours up, it makes it nice and easy. There's no charts to check. And similar again, those save rolls, very similar again. So nice and three up, billmen, four up. I'll not go through the rest of it, but uh, that would be something that's very simple and easy to, to remember after uh, even a couple of rounds of fighting, I would have thought. And same with just hitting on a four up. There's obviously a few bits and pieces here, here and there. And then you go on to, you take morale if you, if you get too much damage. And just to mention again, we are this. This is absolutely packed full of uh, lovely photographs uh, in here. Uh, just and there's a really nice example here of melee with some lovely photos uh, of knights attacking uh, archers by the looks of it and absolutely lamping them by the end of it. But again, you know, examples in rules are always good. I like to see this. I think this is uh, this is something that a lot of rules miss out on. A very you know. Uh, they don't have to be complex, but just to show you the steps that you take to do this. This is a very good introduction to somebody who is not only new to the period, but also new to wargaming. And yes, you know, some of us are wargamers of several decades. We know, you know, we, do, we, we don't need this stuff. But there are people who it's the first time they picked up a historical wargaming book, uh, historical wargaming rules. And I think this is something that, you know, really shines in this book in particular. And we'll talk about it later because there's more of this to come. Now we cover stuff like morale. Uh, this comes from taking disarray tokens and morale tokens and then you do a, basically a morale test when you get to a certain point when you lose morale uh, when you lose a melee for example or <clears throat> if you lose enough uh, figures from shooting things like that and then you also do a morale test at the end of the turn as well it's not really a morale phase but it's it's kind of a test that everybody does at the end of the turn uh, which is quite nice I like it I, I don't like rigid turn uh, turns so you know where you have where you typically have a uh, a, a move a fight a shooting and then morale kind of thing so this this really makes that it makes it a bit nicer so you're taking when you take hits you take morale as well it mixes it up a little bit more and just makes it feel a little bit more free free flowing and uh, and and uh, and good, I think, from my point of view. Descriptions here of disarray and also daunted. This is a morale states that you will get into. One thing I wanted to mention as well uh, that I picked up on, uh, let me just go back, is the fighting melee. So the first round, you do it just normally, fours up to hit. Second round, then you're hitting all fives up as the men are starting to get tired. And then on the third round, uh, it gets worse and worse as well because you're also getting disarray tokens as well in the second round of fighting. Then you can't re-roll anything in the third round. So this is a really nice way of making it feel like the men are getting tired and fatigued as the fighting continues. So the longer this goes on, 
the tire that they are and I think that's you know that's a really nice uh, easy way of doing it and it's a very simple way of doing it and it's something that lots of rules that don't actually include fatigue and tiredness in them and that's a, a really nice overview of it I just wanted to mention that again something else that stood out to me as I was reading through uh, the other thing as well, uh, just to win the battle, there's a few ways to win the battle if your leader's killed, if you get the objective or whatever, or if you take your enemy's uh, army morale tokens and these you take every time you win, you know, a, a melee or whatever, or you, they, the unit breaks or something. There's various things. You take the you take these tokens off them. When they've got no more of these tokens to give, that's it, it's game over. So they've lost all their morale. And again, really nice way of uh, doing basically force morale. Uh, and you're, 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 you are collecting them from your enemy. They can also collect them back as well. That's the other thing. They can take theirs back if they are able to to rally some of their their units. So you know it can go a little bit back and forth before the actual final game is over. It's not you know a, a swamp. Uh, 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 basically, you don't just get swamped with uh, bad morale. It's very nice. And a couple of uh, optional rules here. But also, as well, what is good as well in this is there's a summary of the new core rules. So this basically just shows you what has been updated from the original uh, free version back in War Games Illustrated two years ago. So a few things here. Again, as I say, I've not read the originals, so I don't know them, and I uh, so I don't know what has been updated. But you know, the, those of the you that that do know them inside out will see that there is uh, at least an update on them. Now we get into the history part of this. So we start here with uh, the Hundred Years' War, or Gallia, as it is also called in here, because they're all given a name. And this is uh, this is an aspect of the book that I quite like. So we're up to page forty now, or to one hundred eighty. I'm not going to through. I won't go through every single page in this. I'm just going to show you one of these as an example and flick through some of the other ones as well to give you an idea. The Gallia, we've got the Hundred Years' War, so we've got some, an introduction to it. Again. I'm going to go on a limb here and I'm going to say that, you know, I don't know how uh, ac academically proof this is, but I'm going to say that this, you know, if I was coming into Wargaming, this is a, a reasonable introduction, I think, to the period uh, and then also the Wargaming potential of the period as well. So there's this, you know, not only the history, you've also got you know, a bit of a description as to how you can game it. Then on top of this as well, we've got the theatres of conflict. This is just within this. So, you know, quite a lot of information here. And also uh, specific rules for that particular period. This is the same for all the periods that, are, that come through in here. And uh, so it just tells you about the different formations that you can take, uh, the different uh, limits on armies and things, and what would be used and what wouldn't be used, which is very nice against somebody who, who lacks that... Uh, background research, uh, but this is the kind of thing that would probably want push you into looking into uh, into the those uh, that extra research and things. I think so. The army restrictions here as well, and just different types of true qualities, and also uh, even notes on scenario design. Then uh, we have the action lists because there's going to be a few different actions in some of these different periods as well that things do, and. Also, any extra actual core rules, so uh, anything that happens, uh, you know, this is a slight change to the original War of the Roses rules, which is nice, and, and a scenario as well, uh, both with the order of battle for here for a free company and also for the French and your objectives and everything, uh, capture the wagon and recover the loot and also the map as well. So a couple of scenarios are built into each of these. So this is the second one here as well. And then we go on to the Hussite Wars as well here. And it's very similar. Again, I will just flick through because it's a similar thing that you've got the, the history, the war game of potential, then the rules changes, and then also any action lists and scenarios. So you're not lost for scenarios and for background information on any of these periods. And that's something that, again, you know, as somebody, uh, who doesn't know this period or doesn't know this wargaming period at all? I, I find that very, very nice. I think this is a, it's a really good addition to rules, and I, and I do wish that some uh, some rules writers would would do a little bit of this as well. Uh, just in some cases, you know, uh, naming no names. 
Uh, but let's just let's just get through. I'll, I'll I'll just show you a couple more of these. So we, uh, there's a scenario there for this is for the Hussite Wars. Uh, then we've got the Italian Wars. I know that Ken over at the Yorkshire Gamer looked at this, and I think he had some some issues with it. But because he does far larger games than uh, never mind the Bill Hooks, I think that's probably was his issues with it. Uh, again, I wouldn't really know the difference uh, the differences here, but I would be more than happy really just to pick this up and. You know, if I was going to start making armies, start working from uh, well the information in here before I started looking into further historical uh, documents and what have you and and, uh, and sources to uh, to, to, to fine hone it, I guess. Uh, here we are, Northumbria. This is one I wanted to show you because uh, Ian over at Flags of War has just or is about to release their Border Reavers game. So, but that is even more. This is a you know, large skirmish, and there's so I think this would work quite nicely side by side with their smaller games. You know, you could have a larger campaign game with these, and then go to that smaller camp, smaller uh, skirmish game with the Flags of War stuff as well. Uh, and what I did notice as well here <laughs> is a couple of Flags of War figures. <laughs> the uh, I think it's a captain, isn't it? And, uh, and on the mounted board of Reavers as well so that was nice to see those in the rules as well uh, represented there because I did a review on some of those figures and they are lovely uh, so let's just I'm going to skip through this stuff because uh, again you know this follows a si similar kind of line as the other stuff does so that's the Lusitania things Lusitania rules uh, Hibernia so medieval island as well and then the rules for those as well. What I wanted to do was jump to the very back end here and we have this section here starting at page 129 on painting, modelling and kit bashing. Uh, this is something that is missing from a lot of rules and I, and obviously I think this has been included largely because they're looking at getting people introduced to the, not only to the period but also to the hobby and I re again I really appreciate this kind of thing. I think the more we can do as a wargamer is to get somebody started in historical wargaming the better and this is something that say a company like games workshop does really well they have whole sections in their rules about you know uh, the modeling aspects of it and for most of us the modeling aspects and the painting aspects of wargaming is at least i'd say 70 percent plus of the hobby uh, so you know to ignore it is is to ignore it at your peril i guess and i think this is a really good way of doing it because these these periods are so colourful and so different as well. I think it's well worth just putting people in the right direction as to you know how to paint and uh, and getting paint as well on figures quickly and easily. And there's some lovely examples of stuff here as well. Really nice. Obviously, this a lot of this has probably come off the back of War Games Illustrated, which so you would expect it. But uh, there's some great painting uh, introductory stuff here. So I'm, I am going to read through this just anyway just to see if there's any tips in there I can get. Uh, I know uh, Ken at Yorkshire Gamer got upset about the wet palette, but you know, a lot of them use a lot of people use them these days. That's uh, that's the way it is. Uh, and then uh, I did like this as well, the blow by blow paint job. That's almost uh, lardy territory. That kind of uh, smutty innuendo. Uh, but it, again, it just gives you a really good, I think, introduction to uh, to painting. You know, from from uh, from somebody who's who's never done it. You know, who's probably daunted by it. Uh, just give you some basic techniques, really, to get started and get going. And then the same with the modelling as well. Gives you a couple of ideas as to what to uh, what to use, what you will need. Uh, very simple stuff, just for tokens and uh, what have you. And this is this is all. You know, these look much better on the battlefield than uh, the either tokens or the MDF tokens or whatever. So, I think you know this is a good way of. Uh, getting people to up their game a little bit on the tabletop as much as anything else and simple stuff really simple easy stuff to do that anybody could do really uh, just with a little bit of thought and work uh, and there we go a little bit more uh, lots of dead people <laughs> people dead in ditches that kind of thing you know typical stuff from uh, uh, medieval warfare and then also even talking about kit bashing as well so you don't have to just stick with the uh, the figures that you buy in the box not going to go too much into that just because you know if you're watching this you probably know a lot about this but i think it's it's a very good way of just getting people introdu introduced to these different methods of doing things uh, and just a way of m uh, changing up their armies to make them look very nice lastly 
we have, as I've already mentioned there, we've got cards, tokens and quick reference sheets all in the back here and there are well, 100, uh, what, 162 to 179 uh, in the pages so that's uh, getting on for nearly 20 pages of tokens and cards and things so you could quite easily cut these out or print them out uh, and then laminate them or stick them in card protectors or whatever and you've got yourself automatically a, uh, a set of the decks that you need for this and then you've also got tokens as well same again you can either cut these out uh, photocopy them print them out and these are downloadable from their website and then we also have the quick reference sheets for each of those individual periods and uh, time periods within the rules themselves so everything is all on there so just to run through, you've got everything all the way through to the Albion Quick Reference Sheet, which is the, which is the basics. So that brings you to the end of the book. And as I say, it's a bit of a preview rather than a review because I haven't played the game. Uh, all I've done is, is had a quick read through of it. Uh, it appeals very strongly to me, actually. I'm, uh, I'm quite pleased to see it. I, uh, I was wondering what I was going to get when I got it in the, in the post. So I'm kind of taking it as though I'm somebody who's never done any medieval wargaming before, or bits of it, only bits of it, uh, and, you know, what would I expect to get out of a book like this, or out of rules like this, and I think this, to be perfectly honest, this is probably a pretty good introduction to the to the period, uh, and it's all, all wrapped up in 180 pages. It's a pleasure to read, it's a nice read, it's easy to read, it's quite funny uh, in, its, uh, in its writing style, uh, and I think it is uh, it is well worth its money. I think if this is something that you want to get into and something that you're you're looking uh, looking to get into, there are other games out there that are obviously more complex. Uh, there are arguments to say that you know this is probably quick play or I don't know <laughs> streamlined uh, as we were talking about recently, or the guys were talking about at the Plastic Crack podcast recently. Uh, but I think it would you know it'll be a fast game, it'll be a fun game. Uh, and that's probably what you want out of a war game these days with a little bit of history tacked onto the back of it. I like to have history and I also like to have playability in a game and this seems to have both of it to be perfectly honest. Uh, I'm, you know, it looks nice, it's, uh, it's a very attractive uh, book uh, and I think you know that alone will get people to, be, to, to go and buy it. Uh, great battle sealed on the front of it uh, and lovely pictures on the inside. All right, well, I hope you've liked this preview, review. If you have, uh, leave me a comment in the, uh, the the comment section down below. Give it a like, uh, give it a share as well if you think there's other people out there that might be interested in uh, seeing this uh, and seeing what sort of this is all about. Great, uh, great basic introduction to historical wargaming, I would say, here. Uh, if you like the uh, like what you see here, there is plenty more reviews of other games. Uh, there's plenty more games on the channel as well. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe. Uh, hit that like button. Do hit the subscribe button. If you want to help the channel out, you can uh, subscribe to my Patreon, where you will get early access with ad-free uh, videos and also uh, other bits and pieces as well. And you can also help out with channel membership as well as. So I shall leave it at that and say thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next Storm of Steel video.